Good afternoon. Welcome to the Foreign Press Center. As you may know, interest in the United States and elsewhere in the world in UFOs is now at an all-time high. The New York Times just last week noted that the three books, books about alien visits are selling briskly in the United States, and one has been on the uh, nonfiction bestseller list for weeks. Today, we have with us some of the folk who will be, who will be participating in an international conference at the American University, June 26, 28, on the subject of UFOs from a worldwide perspective. With us today is Dr. Bruce McAbee, a Navy physicist and chairman of the Fund for UFO Research. Dr. McAbee will introduce the other members of the panel, and each member will speak briefly, and then we will take your questions. Dr. McAbee, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Pope. And I uh, welcome all you people here. I'm glad to see a, a sizable audience. Uh, I hope you people are well are representing the world, as it were, because uh, we in our symposium are trying to represent the world. This is a phenomenon which uh, sort of was sprung upon us in 1947 and has become a worldwide phenomenon since then, the sighting of strange objects um, flying around, doing their own thing in the sky, uh, starting in 1947 and going up uh, as recently as and within the last few weeks there have been sightings. Uh, the uh, occasion of this week, actually yesterday, was the 40th anniversary, you might say, of the first widely reported sighting. And we are sponsoring the uh, a symposium at American University to provide a world, uh, world view overview of the subject. Um, I will have a few more words to, to say on that, and I will uh, later on introduce some of the uh, representatives of the various countries that we have right here at this uh, meeting. But first, I would like to introduce the members of the panel and uh, then uh, turn this over to Larry Koss, who will uh, begin the discussion. Now, my name is Bruce McAbee. I'm a Navy physicist. Uh, my work for the Navy has nothing to do with UFOs. This is a part-time effort on my, uh, of my own hobby, you might say. Next to me is uh, Jamie Chandra, who has been investigating uh, the activities of the United States government uh, in regard to UFOs. Next to him is Bud Hopkins, who uh, has been investigating <coughs> reports of what have been called UFO abductions, people who claim that they've been taken on board craft and examined and so on. He can tell you about that. And uh, last is... Uh, uh, Larry Koss, who is an educator, and uh, I believe you would like to start the discussion. Thank you very much. I asked uh, Bruce and Jim to be able to speak to you briefly in advance of this uh, discussion to, to maximize the opportunity here, and I hope you forgive me. This is new for me, so I may read some of this. And, and uh, I've recently entered this field as an educator because I see a pressing need for responsible and truly educational presentation to the, to the public of information in the area of UFO and extraterrestrial activity. For the last 40 years, we have not had that. We've had instead, we've instead been mired for 40 years in skepticism and controversy, which if we were to have addressed medical phenomena and challenges in a similar matter, manner, would never have allowed us the advances in that field available mm -hmm. to us today. The media, you, play a key role in this. For you are a major link in the flow of information to the public. You shape public education, opinion, and response. The people you will meet here today have devoted most of their adult lives to the study of a phenomenon which does exist and is right in front of our faces. It is, however, so awesome the world has not yet been willing to acknowledge it. They have pursued, these people have pursued this study not only without recognition throughout the world of its credibility, but also in the midst of ridicule, obstruction of relevant information, and in the absence of private or public funding. They have each had to maintain full-time jobs on the side to support an area of study which has implications for all humanity, yet for which that humanity has not been willing to recognize. Characteristically, as humans, we do not move until a new need is literally hanging upon our faces. We are responding to AIDS because people are dying around us. We are not yet responding to environmental needs because it is not quite realistic enough for us. The truth is UFOs, which we perhaps should call EFOs for extraterrestrial flying objects, do exist worldwide, as the symposium will evidence. The truth also is that extraterrestrials are engaging with us now, as Bud Hopkins will define for you. And the truth is that our governments know these truths, as Jamie will point out to you. I invite you, therefore, to have the courage and vision to listen and respond to your public with new eyes and ears. I invite you to have the courage to move beyond the skeptical and sensationalized 
and controversial treatment which for 40 years has gotten us nowhere. And I invite you to take an honest look, examine the data, be willing to see a new reality, and have the courage to share that with your countrymen. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Now uh, we'll have a few more words from the uh, people on the front panel here, and then I will introduce our international guests. Uh, you'd like to say a few words, Jamie? Uh, I think Bud will probably pick up first. Well, uh, okay. I work in the area, which is totally outrageous, of uh, investigating cases of people who have been picked up by UFOs. Now, most of us have heard of the Betty and Barney Hill case, the very first case to make uh, the headlines really internationally. It occurred in 1961, and the case was publicized widely in 1966. At the time I heard about this, even though I had had a UFO sighting myself and was very interested in the subject, I simply said, this can't be. I cannot believe this. And I had a very good reason for not believing it. I found it unbelievable. Uh, not because the evidence wasn't there, not because these people weren't credible, or that the case hadn't been thoroughly investigated, but I simply found myself unable to believe such a thing. Uh, we're in the middle of what is the ultimate Copernica, Copernican uh, revolution right now. We're having to come face to face with the idea that, in fact, there is an intelligence out there that is different uh, from ours, superior to ours in a certain way, in certain ways. Uh, the cases that I have looked into, and I have dealt over 12 years with 140 some different people who have been abducted. Of that 140, about five have allowed their names to be used. There is a tremendous hesitancy a tremendous desire to hide from the people like you who would like to talk to these people because there's a, sh a sense of shame connected with it, a sense of being involved in something that the abductee himself or herself believes is, is almost unbelievable. Uh, it's a very uh, emotionally rending story. These people come, though, from every walk of life. Three of them hold PhD degrees. Five of them are psychotherapists. One is a microbiologist at a New York City hospital. Two were police officers, one a New York City police officer, and so forth, a museum curator. These are people who we could interchange with all of you sitting right here, and there would be no apparent difference in the way people look and act. It has happened to them. They have been picked up, taken into craft, put on tables. There's a physical examination. Uh, there are physical scars that result. There are ground traces when the craft lands. There is a tremendous amount of evidence, and that's something I hope that we'll have a chance to look, look into later. Just one quick thing. I'll just show you some of the drawings that have been made by some of the individuals who have uh, been abducted of their abductors, of the occupants of the UFOs, incredibly similar. And just one last little note, a man who had remembered a great deal of his abduction experiences without hypnosis, it's a myth that hypnosis is essential to these cases, uh, took one look after he made his drawing of the figures that he remembered, he took one look at these pictures and jumped almost out of the chair, this is a big man, a businessman, burst into tears. And then he said to me, Bud, where did you get those pictures? And I said, I got them the same way I got your picture. The evidence is there, gentlemen and ladies, and I hope you consider it. Can we ask you a follow-up? Go ahead. Since we have an international audience, what countries did these take place uh, at? Well, the pictures I showed you here, one took place in Mexico, one in Canada, um, and the other four in the United States. Uh, we have them from all over the world, and. Uh, Cynthia Hine from uh, Zimbabwe has cases that are parallel these, South Africa, it's international. You want to say some words? Uh, All right. well, the area of uh, investigation that I and my associates, uh, Bill Moore and Stanton Friedman, uh, have worked in primarily is the area of what does the government really know? The first question you have to try to, to get at is who is the government? I mean, the government doesn't, isn't one body that uh, that you can approach and they can either tell you the truth or not tell you the truth. The government's broken down into a whole series of agencies and, and groups. There appears to be, and uh, our investigations uh, indicate very strongly, there appears to be one group responsible for all the information regarding UFOs. And in fact, uh, the government has a term that they've coined, which is IAC, which stands for Identified Alien Craft, as opposed to Unidentified Flying Object. Um, we decided primarily that the, the best route to getting good information was to try to aggressively pursue and cultivate strong contacts within the government, uh, within the intelligence community. We have been successful in making inroads in that direction. And 
some of the fruits of, of, of our research uh, came up with a presidential briefing document for President Eisenhower, which I believe you each have in, in, in your packet there, which is probably the most significant document ever to surface if we can ultimately get the final absolute validation on that. Uh, our belief at this point is that it is true, but we can't absolutely certify that. We've researched that document for two and a half years. We have been able to determine that all of the individuals involved are the right kind of people, both background-wise, uh, the government affiliations, their science and uh, uh, intelligence or military backgrounds. Everything interfaces perfectly. We have found support information through the National Archives also. It appears that one of the reasons that the government would try to hide this kind of information is not a cover-up in the true sense of the word cover-up. Cover-up generally is a word that connotes wrongdoing. Somebody's hiding something for um, their own gain or, or specific purpose of that nature. From the beginning, it appears that the government would have been grossly irresponsible were they to simply dump this information on an unsuspecting public. They had to put the most responsible scientists, military, uh, professional minds that they could gather to examine what was going on. What was this phenomena? Where were these craft or these things coming from? Relative to a crash in the desert in 1947 in New Mexico, could we duplicate this material? If these people could come here from somewhere else, what was, what was the threat to national security? What was the threat to world security? And national security, of course, involves a lot of different levels. It's not just military. National security and, and world security involves economic, psychological, religious, all ramifications. So all of those areas had to be examined. They had to be studied. And a government or an, a group assigned to this specific area had to maintain an absolute covert status so that unwarranted conclusions would not be be built upon a limited amount of information. So disinformation processes and those things normally attributed to intelligence agencies had to be put into effect. And it was in essence for security and security of the world in the United States and other, other areas as well as um, you know, it's for, for the protection process, in other words, in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that sense. Debunking systems were set up and, and in many cases deliberately so, so that groups would not become so aggressive with a specific point of view in mind. They wanted to continue to try to diffuse that. This is what our research indicates. Um, so we have a major document, which appears to be the most significant document that's ever come out on the subject. We have a lot of research and a lot of contact with certain individuals within the intelligence community and all of the indications are that this document and the things that uh, we have uncovered are the tip of the iceberg. What it's ultimately going to take to get the rest of this information to come to the front and to come out, I don't think ultimately is going to be lawsuits and challenging and, 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 a, and an enormous adversary mm -hmm. position between uh, the press and the government. It's going to take people working consistently and in good conscience and with great integrity to try to get the material, to try to ascertain the validity of the material and to be able to progress in that fashion. So as a statement, I'll, I'll end there and we'll open up to, to questions now. Well, I would like to uh, make a, uh, a few more comments and then introduce the international guest here. Uh, first of all, I should point out with regard to the documents in the press package, although they are the most significant, you don't have a press package? We'll have a sign-up sheet for requests for additional comments. Okay. Um, there has been, over the uh, years, a continual uh, accumulation of tidbits of information the accumulation rate increased within the last 10 years as a result of the, of the Freedom of Information Act here in the United States when uh, we could write for documents from the government and uh, begin to put together a uh, story of what our own government in the United States was doing over the 40 years and it became clear that there were a lot of agencies collecting information. 
this is not just a problem for the United States. The uh, other uh, governments have also um, treated the UFO problem seriously without necessarily telling uh, the people in their countries. Uh, Dr. Roberto Panotti from Italy, who is not here today, will be here tomorrow, uh, can talk about uh, what he found out from the Italian government. William Chalker of Australia, who is not here today but will be here tomorrow, uh, will be at American University tomorrow, can tell you uh, what he found in the files of the Royal uh, Australian Air Force. Uh, Stanton Friedman, who is here standing up over there representing Canada, uh, can indeed tell you about uh, what was found in the files of the Canadian government. Um, Unfortunately, uh, a, an official representative of France, Jean-Jacques Velasco, who is the head of a, a group called the, uh, translating into English, the Group for Studying Aerospatial Phenomena, a subgroup of the French National Space Agency, CNES. Uh, he, the, uh, he can tell us, uh, he will be telling us uh, tomorrow, uh, on Saturday, about uh, investigations by this official French group of sightings in France. So uh, this is an international problem for governments as well. Now I'd like to say a few more words about the symposium. There is a proceedings of the symposium which will be available at the symposium already published. These are the papers of the invited speakers. And uh, there will also be a press conference tomorrow at 2 p.m. in the Ward Circle Building at American University during that press conference and afterwards and during the symposium there will be visual and graphic materials for people who come to the symposium. If you want to see photographs, you want to see videotapes of documentaries that have been made, uh, all that material will be available. Okay, now I will introduce the international guests that we have here and then open up the floor for questions. I've already mentioned Stanton Friedman from Canada. Yes. I'd ask him to stand when catching the camera. Okay, Stanton Friedman is standing already. <laughs> Sit down, Stan, so they can get you on camera. <laughs> Starting over here in the back, Paul Norman, would you please stand? From Australia. Willie Smith from uh, the United States, however, he is representing Brazil and Uruguay. Captain Daniel Perese from uh, Argentina, who was actually involved in some UFO sightings in 1965. Vicente Juan Ballester Olmos, who is representing the Iberian Peninsula, mainly Spain. Uh, Cynthia Hind from Zimbabwe in Africa. And Hilary Evans from England. Have I missed anybody? Bill Moore. Well, Bill Moore can stand up. He's representing the United States at the present time. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. If you have any questions for us uh, up here or individual questions for the international guests, yes. I would ask you to wait for the microphones, please. Uh, Connie. I've got two parochial ones. <laughs> Could the, uh, rep I hate to ask this. Could the representatives from Australia and Zimbabwe please come to the microphone and tell us their experiences so that we could help out the countries we cover for? <laughs> I'd be very grateful. Thank you. In Australia, our main case is the disappearance of Frederick Valentich, a 20-year-old pilot who disappeared over Bass Strait while he was flying to an island called King Island. He was describing a long-shaped object uh, that, with maneuverable uh, characteristics far beyond anything that we know about. He, he was uh, describing uh, the maneuverability of an object uh, similar to the ones being reported from all parts of the world. And uh, there's no, been, there have been no, uh, no uh, rubbish or anything found from that plane. The pilot hasn't been heard from since, and he's the 20th such case that's been reported from different parts of the world in the last 30 years. When? When did it happen? October 21st, 1978. Me, Paul Norman, I'm uh, the MUFON representative of Victoria, and I'm also vice president of the Victorian UFO Research Society at uh, Melbourne in Victoria. You're American living in Australia? I, originally American, yes. I've been in Australia for 24 years. First we'll have Mr. Paramo, uh, and then we'll get to... 
Cynthia Hines. <laughs> Cynthia Hines is a Zimbabwe. Yeah. From Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Was asked to, uh, to Cynthia Hines. What she wants to know about incidents in Zimbabwe. <clears throat> well, it's the southern part of Africa. Actually, I must tell you to start with, I'm absolutely shattered that the Americans know so little about Africa because I think you give millions of dollars a year in aid. And I think uh, the schools want to get together a little bit and describe what you're giving away. Um, I just want to tell you that one of the reasons that initially I was very skeptical about UFOs, one of the things that absolutely convinced me was working in the rural areas. I worked uh, with a team who were on a project in Africa where we were giving simple technology to the women in the very backward areas. And I came across a particular case there where there were 20 witnesses and they'd seen a ball of fire rolling across a lawn and eventually, I won't go into details, it's too complicated, but eventually there were three men in shiny suits. Well, they actually said shiny and I was eventually able to obtain the information that the suits were in silver. And the only reason I found out because they spoke Mashona, they're the Mashona tribe from Zimbabwe, northern eastern Zimbabwe, and the reason that they were able to tell me was because one of the gentlemen took a 20 cent coin from his pocket so that I realized the suits were silver. They could only describe it as shiny. And I said, what did you think they were? And this uh, group said, they were the spirits of our ancestors. And I said, but surely the spirits of your ancestors wore furs and lion teeth and uh, monkey bands around their heads and so forth, which they did. And this guy I was talking to thought for a little while and he said, you know, times change. <laughs> so, um, but this, this one particular case convinced me and it's happening continually where I now have since the War of Independence is over and since I have access to these remote areas in Africa where I have speak to the people and they keep on telling me about these things who come down from the sky and I can tell you they're not American helicopters. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Mr. Paramo. Parimu, the Times of India. Could you please tell me if there have been any sightings in the Soviet Union or inside Soviet Union and secondly, has there been any coordination or cooperation between the Soviet Union and the United States in this research effort in an effort to identify these things? Well, first of all, I'd like to point out that we will have a speaker from India, I think. I'm not sure. He had an accident a couple of weeks ago, which uh, made it difficult for him to walk. But uh, there is a paper in the proceedings here by Kanish Nathan, who uh, <coughs> has recited events in India. However, since you ask about the Soviet Union, there have been reports from the Soviet Union. In 1976 or 77, a report uh, surfaced here in the United States, written by a man by the name of Jindilis and another one whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, which was a statistical study of reports in the 66 to 67 time frame in the Soviet Union. 250, uh, 250 reports. I might uh, add that uh, I believe it was, let's see, the 1987, I believe it was two years ago that an incident in Gorky evidently so, uh, was so convincing that the uh, Soviet government allowed an announcement to be made that they were setting up a special UFO investigating group headed by uh, an ex-cosmonaut by the name of Popov? Popovich. Popovich. That was close. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the group that they set up was supposedly going to investigate the Gorky incident. Uh, not very much information has come out as you may, uh, ha well, understand. Uh, and so far as I know, I don't know whether that group is active or not. There was a you know, press announcement that it was formed, that uh, Popovich was heading it, and uh, that was about it. As far as cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union is concerned, I'm not aware of any. We, I personally, wrote to, uh, uh, tried to contact two people in the Soviet Union whose names have turned up in re with regard to the UFO uh, problem. That is, they do have people there who write articles about it occasionally, and I never got any answers. So, 
That's about all I can say about that. Would you like to say something? Uh, just to add that there has been put together a report by uh, Felix Siegel at the Soviet <laughs> Institute of Aviation, whatever the literal translation of that is, uh, in which he gives these couple hundred sightings that Gindelis and company officially investigated with the backing of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. I have a translation of that report, it's about 160 pages long. The point that must be made is that these sightings were compared uh, by Gindelis to sightings in other countries, in France and in the United States and in other countries. And they are very similar kinds of observations by Soviet citizens, and they intentionally stayed away from <coughs> military-related cases, if you understand it. Mm -hmm. Right here. <coughs> What the uh, recent case of an unidentified UFO mentioned at uh, the conference? What is the most recent flying saucer that we saw or any other uh, unidentified? May 29th, May 16th. Is that the anyone want to go? Anyone have one more recent than May 16th? May 16th uh, this year. May 16th of this year in Canada, right? Yes. Is that the uh, the uh, radar only event? Uh, an aircraft flying along in Canada, a uh, 747 again? No, 737. 737, okay. A, a uh, large jet aircraft where the uh, crew picked up on their aircraft radar an object that was traveling, if I remember what, nine miles every second? Every six seconds. Every six seconds. 5,400 miles an hour. That was a radar only sighting. I might point out that it was very similar to one that occurred in Alaska. Oh, in uh, late January, which uh, was also a radar-only sighting by an Alaskan airline jet. Uh, again, a very rapidly moving object pick up on the airplane weather radar. Very large object. Mm -hmm. That's the crucial thing. The return was equivalent to that from six 747s. Aircraft weather radar should not be picking up aircraft at a distance <coughs> greater than 10 miles. But uh, maybe there was a conclusion by FAA about this case. Now you're thinking about the Japan Alaska. Airlines event, the Japan Airlines sighting of November 16th last year, which uh, made it into the press in late December. Now in that case, by, um, the uh, pilot and crew were interviewed very briefly just after they landed on November 16th. And then the, uh, the FAA, the Federal Aeronautics Administration in the United States, did nothing with the information until the late latter part of December when they were first contacted by a Japanese news agency which alerted the FAA to the existence of the sighting in a sense and uh, in January the, the FAA decided to do an investigation to determine whether or not there had been a violation of airspace in Alaska by some aircraft of some sort. They concluded uh, that there had been no violation um, they didn't, they, they explicitly said that it's not their business to investigate UFO sightings and essentially left it at that. And on March 5th of this year, the FAA uh, made available to anyone who wanted to purchase it a package of information on the Japan Airlines sighting. That package included personal testimony by the captain, uh, Mr. Tarauchi, and uh, interviews done by FAA agents, interviews with the captain, the pilot, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the first officer. It also included uh, supplementary information such as the uh, transcript of the uh, tape recording made while the plane, the, uh, the, the people in the airplane were talking to the, uh, the ground air traffic controllers. All, all that information has subsequently been analyzed and uh, it seems clear from the description of the pilot, the co-pilot, and the first officer, that whatever was seen right in front of their plane, a mass, a, a, a very complicated array of lights that moved in an unusual manner, um, has, has not been explained. Jim, we're going to take the several questions over there, 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 there. Yes. That's fine. To uh, Jim Chandra. I'm from Brazilian Television. Uh, specific about the case of the 1947 incident in um, Roswell. Right. Near Roswell, uh, I, I couldn't find here in the uh, in the reproduction of the uh, of the uh, memorandums or documents any reference <laughs> on to what 
might have been done with the four bodies. Uh, and I'd like to ask you if uh, through information or, or, or... You mean where they might be today, that kind of information? If, 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 they, were, if they were preserved or not, or, or what happened? It seems very clear to us, yes, they were preserved. We do not know the precise location. There have been various locations suggested. Now, in case you haven't looked at, what he's referring to is the document I made reference to earlier is a presidential briefing document for then President-elect Eisenhower. The document was <coughs> dated November 18, 1952. And at that point, Eisenhower was, in fact, briefed uh, that there was a crash of a craft in the desert, and that four dead alien bodies were, in fact, recovered from that craft. Um, yeah, obviously, it's, it, it indicates there that the, that the medical conclusions were that they were non-homo non sapiens. Now, my question to you right. is, do you believe that uh, parts of those bodies or have been preserved up to today? Let's say that the, the individuals very competent, need-to-know position individuals that we're talking with, all indications are yes. They are. Any indication on, on where this bodies or remains might be now? Not specifically. That is not information they would like to have out. If, if I, as, an, uh, as a reporter, call the Navy or, or, or the, the, the Air Force and just ask about this incident, obviously, what I'm going to get is a no comment. You get a no comment or that they do not involve themselves in that kind of thing. And the okay. reason you get that is because the, the group responsible for this is, is called Majestic 12. Majestic 12 controls all of their own material. So okay. they might function through normal agencies, be it the Air Force or something else, it, it, it certainly, but all is then controlled by that group. I can quote in a story of mine that there are people who believe that the remains of those bodies are still to be found in, a, in, a, in, a, in some way preserved. Yes, that's, that's all, all indications say that is true, yes. Thank you. Right here in front. Uh, yeah. Yeah, from Wiesel Trown newspaper in Amsterdam. <laughs> uh, so what reason would the U.S. government or any other government have uh, to conceal the existence of, uh, uh, of, of whatever of alien contact of alien alien. contact for su such, such an extended period? Well, there's, there's two ways to look at that. First of all, if you look at it from the standpoint that the document that, that, that we're releasing at this point is a standalone, that that incident happened, okay, let's for a moment say, okay, yes, we believe it's true, that incident did happen, the government was there, why would they hold that document secret for 40 years? and then release it. That is a good assumption. I mean, that, that is, that's, that the government would be wrong to do that, to hold it for 40 years for that one isolated incident. However, if what they de determined and discovered was that that was only the beginning and that this began to escalate, that it has not been a void for those 40 years, that there's been a considerable amount of activity within that time frame, then there becomes a much greater justification for not releasing that at that time because they had to continue to study and investigate and to deal with the situation until they could determine they were satisfied that they had a grasp of it. May I add sure. just a quick little comment on that? Uh, if there has been, let's say, no contact between governments and the occupants of UFOs and all a president could do would be to announce to the public that these things absolutely exist. They can outfly anything we have. They can pick our people up at will, paralyzing them, then returning them. There's been no communication. Just say they, are, they exist, they can outfly anything we have. They haven't talked to us. We'll let you know when they decide to talk to us and when they, we know whether they're friendly or not. And I said, if that's all they could say, I would rather be in the liquor business at that time than the real estate business. Because, because for this reason, for this reason, if if, uh, when you think of, of how all of our basic economic decisions that are t most important are based on long-term assumptions that 20 years down the road it's going to be pretty much the same world as it is today, if you threw that information out uh, in, a, in a world where people are taking out 30-year mortgages and saving for college education and so forth, you might truly panic people and turn the economic uh, world into something rather chaotic. It could happen. I'm not justifying the government's 
uh, position if, in fact, that's what they, the way they are reasoning. But you see, without the, that possibility of communication, without being able to make an announcement saying not only they exist, but we've talked to them and they're really very nice or they're very friendly or whatever or something, if it's left completely open, I think you have the, the setting for real panic. I have one other question. Uh, on what uh, you said, uh, the dead bodies probably are still somewhere. On what is that information? Is that information you have? On what is that based? It's based on um, our contacts within the intelligence community. Those in an active need to know position actively within the intelligence community. They will tell you, but not release that information. Right, right. We have we have aggressively pursued and developed these contacts and 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 developed a a, a trust as much as one can develop that in uh, you know in, in a trust relationship. In other words, we've been able to verify information that they have disseminated to us, and they have been able to uh, trust the integrity with which we would begin to deal with that information. Right here. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Chandra, <clears throat> what does the Air Force say? Presumably the Air Force has got control of the radars, NORAD, and so on. They must have all, all kinds of official information, which is, is this not available under the Freedom for Information Act? And can you say what, what happens when you've been trying to get this information? Which, which you, you're well, well what, you, what you find is through all normal official channels, mm. you cannot normally find anything. You can find bits and pieces, and, and, and that's not to demean the work of anyone that's, that's worked in that area. And as, as uh, Dr. Maccabee can point out, there's been significant uh, ground covered in, in, in that direction. But the official thing and the official method and the, the method of operation, it appears, that the majestic operatives work in is that anything that is significant that relates directly to the things that they're dealing with goes into their category and is therefore then outside of normal channels. It is exempted from access from any other, any normal method, FOIA or whatever. Could I just follow that? Yeah. In the case of the, the, the Japan Airlines thing, there was mm -hmm. radar, and they must have, must have, that's surely official, isn't it? Not well, for well, certain aspects, and I think Dr. Magby pointed out, that you can get, you, you can, you can purchase the results of, of those things. Um, and they are the difference between the Japan Airlines place, incident place and place actually having microphone. bodies or pieces of a craft. The Japan Airlines incident, uh, you know, is a sighting, and it, it, the the uh, the governments of the world, if they, if let's assume they are trying to cover up something, have had a tough time doing it because there have been so many sightings that are essentially in the open record. That is, anybody can go and interview numerous witnesses to events. Um, uh, even official government witnesses can be interviewed. Uh, pilots, air, military people on duty, and so on. Uh, if you just had the open record, what I like to call the open record that anybody can go and look at, if you just took the open record of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of sightings throughout the world, uh, and studied that very carefully, you would have a very strong case for something flying around. Then when you add in all this information which has been leaking out literally over the years, um, you have not only a strong case for something flying around, but a strong case for governments knowing more about it than they've told their people. Now, now in, in, let me just step, uh, pick up on that very line. Is this the greatest secret that's ever been kept? No, the secret really has not been kept. They have been leaking things out about the secret for a long time. It is nothing new for us to sit here and talk about aliens from outer space, about the possibility of crashed craft, about the possibility of bodies. In the 50s, it was an enormous threat. In movies, everything portrayed it as an enormous threat, the possibility of that threat. War of the Worlds, uh, all of those kind of, you know, United States versus the flying saucers, you name it, you know, all of those kinds of things evolving into the 80s where we have movies like Close Encounters and E.T., where the aliens now are so friendly that kids will hide them in their closet because uh, the big folks will want to lock them up and, and, and examine them. So have they kept the secret, per se? No. They've kept the evidence. You have to understand that we're not sitting here in 1987 saying, uh, before it was if this is the first time that anybody has ever talked seriously about flying saucers. The largest press conference in uh, uh, Washington after World War II occurred in July of 1952. 
uh, as a result of sightings, radar and visual over the Capitol here in Washington. And uh, at that con conference, a general who carried it, who put it on, uh, General Samford, made the statement that there are incredible sightings by credible people. We'll so that's as long ago as 1952. Okay. We'll go over here now. Kathy Gerchik, Washington Reporting Service. Uh, does there appear to be any kind of pattern to the sightings, geographic or otherwise? Um, sightings are, have, have occurred over the last 40 years throughout the world. If there is a variation in that, it is in the times at which sighting maxima occur. In other words, the number of sightings per unit time. In the United States, we had a big flap in 1947. That is, a, the term flap is used to refer to a large number of sightings in a short period of time. Actually, there were sightings around the world in 1947, but the United States got most of the, uh, uh, appears to have had most of them. In any event, in 1952 uh, was the largest flap in the United States, maybe until 1973. In 1952, the U.S. Air Force logged 1,500 reports in one year. In 1954, there was a major flap in France, also in Spain and Italy. Not in Spain, but yes, in Portugal. Portugal, okay. Um, at various other times, uh, let's see, uh, jumping up more recently, 1978 was a large flap in Italy, and I don't know whether in France as well that time, I think. 1978 was a, there were a large, a large number of sightings throughout the world, and I've, the reason I mentioned Italy is because I was reading Dr. Panati's paper, and he has this graph of sightings as a function of time, and there's this great big pole, you know, as you plot time this way, a number of sightings per month. There's a great big uh, spike in 1978. Um, there haven't been a lot of, uh, there hasn't been a, a big flap maybe since 1978. There have been a continuation of sightings that come in, uh, reports are made at the rate of several a day, I would guess, on the average. Uh, and uh, that's been continuing over the last four or five years. Philippe Martins, uh, Swiss TV. Um, I'd like to hear you about the abductions. Uh, uh, if we have to take it that they can ad abduct people, and, and first, in, in what conditions? In their swimming pool, the bus stop, or wh how were they abducted first? Why would they pick only 140 people and not get a better statistical basis? Well, and, and, okay. and third, why wouldn't they return the people? Why would they indeed let them uh, uh, go free? Uh, how do you explain this? Uh, well, the 140 I referred to are people, cases that I have personally investigated on a, on a total face-to-face -face personal basis. Uh, there have been thousands and thousands of investigations into abduction cases. I would say uh, when all the various investigators who worked in this area, when their totals are put together, there's no real accurate way of measuring this. Incidentally, just to backtrack a quick second, uh, the question previously about flaps and the numbers of sightings, uh, I think that we always have to understand that the numbers of sightings that occur, uh, or the numbers of abductions or whatever, are a function of what we are privileged to hear about through uh, press interest, through uh, a, a very uh, adept uh, sort of reporting network in the UFO organizations. Uh, I think sightings, uh, sighting flaps have a great deal to do with uh, press attention rather than, uh, not that the sightings aren't real, but suddenly the press gets very interested and starts reporting many, many cases that otherwise would simply have not made the, the newspaper. So it's very hard to correlate what is really going on in the world with what we are privileged to find out about through the press or through organizations. In terms of the abductions, it is a worldwide phenomenon that involves thousands of people, as I've mentioned. There is a strict pattern that seems to occur. This is very important. Uh, obviously, any one of these cases is, uh, so bizarre that one might just shrug, as I did many years ago, and say, well, that's unbelievable, therefore I won't believe it. Uh, not that there isn't evidence for it. But the patterns, of course, are the areas in which you can place some kind of faith that these same things occur over and over again in the same details. The person is usually abducted as a child first, roughly from ages of four to eight. Very, very often, very commonly, that child has a very deep cut, uh, an incision, often on the back of the leg, sometimes the front of the leg, whatever. The cuts are of two types, a very thin hairline type of cut, and another one which is a circular scoop mark, as if a little layer of cells has just been scooped out. The scars, many years later, are still visible and extremely similar. And very often, if the child's memory has been erased, which occurs in these cases, uh, we don't know how that operates, obviously. 
uh, if the child's memory is, era is erased, very often the family remembers this very vividly because perhaps the child has disappeared from the front yard. Turns up two hours later, the child doesn't know where he or she has been. And then the, the mother will say, discovers a very deep cut on the back of the leg and the child is wearing blue jeans, say, and there's no tear in the pants. That child, as a young adult, is then usually reabducted, as if he or she has been tagged the way we might select an animal, perhaps at random, and uh, follow it uh, in a sort of zoological investigation. Uh, very often then, when that child is, has, been, has passed through puberty, in another abduction, uh, ova and sperm samples have been taken. This dates right back to the Betty and Barney Hill case, which is one of the aspects of that case, the first one we knew about. And that person uh, who has been abducted is liable to have this happen four, five, six, seven times. We don't really know. How many times has this happened? Uh, to, a, to an individual? Yes, to, for one child, maybe five, six, seven, eight times. It's hard to know. For that, for for that case. Child, for this one person, yes, as if they are being followed, attracted at intervals through life. It's a long, complex story. But I should point out, it doesn't happen just to one person at, one, at once. I have one case in which seven people were abducted simultaneously, five people, four people. Their recollections are extraordinarily similar uh, afterwards. So, I think she was asking about that specific case. Uh, you named the name of the person? No, I didn't name the person. You named the case? I, I referred to the Betty and Barney Hill case as a, sort of the prototype case, the first one we heard Has about. Has that specific case, the person involved in that case, been abducted three, the, four, or five the, times? Barney Hill died shortly after that case came to light, not long afterwards. Betty Hill has, so far as I know, there doesn't seem to be an earlier abduction with her. It hasn't really been looked into, I think, very seriously. We've had long conversations. This idea, uh, but it hasn't been thoroughly examined, I mean, whether there were earlier cases for her. I suspect there were for her husband. But the basic thing is we were not aware of this pattern until the last uh, maybe five or six years it's come you to light. those drawings that all look the same. Is that because uh, it's the same people coming back on all these sightings that we've had? It's a yeah, nobody knows, but I'd say 85% roughly of the humanoid descriptions that we get are of that particular type uh, the, the other, let's say, 15%, I'm making rough guesses here, are rather varied. We have some other physical types that seem quite different. But the 85%, the bulk, mm -hmm. the figures are roughly anywhere from three and a half to five feet tall, uh, very large craniums, uh, small lower face, slit mouth, very large eyes, they're hairless, the skin is a grayish white, uh, they have a rather thin body, long, thin arms and, and hands. Uh, and the communication in these cases is through some sort of telepathic method. We don't understand how any of this works. But over and over and over again, these details emerge. And what I've done in, in this book and I've done in, in previously when I published something, I have withheld certain details that are very specific so that when new cases arise, I have a way of checking the veracity of the new case against material that's never been published. And I can say that I've already gotten, say, about... Uh, nine new cases that echo certain details uh, in this book that have never been known, uh, never been made public. But they're very tiny details, very specific. But if I were to come to you and, and tell you I've been abducted and, and describe, uh, you know, the uh, alien as looking like a box of cornflakes, you'd probably dismiss the theory as being not fitting the pattern, no? No, no? absolutely not, no. You find me very open-minded. I think we should make it clear that if you came saying that, you know, the first thing you say is, well, I was abducted and the guy looked like a box of cornflakes, uh, maybe it was Wheaties, um, you'd be subjecting yourself to a, a sort of slow torture to simply go to allow yourself to be interviewed by Bud. In other words, the people who uh, have, that Bud is willing to say have been abducted have been intentionally interviewed. Uh, over many, in some, in some cases, the investigations have taken several years. You'd better have a very good story. Furthermore, right. you better come out with something under hypnosis which is completely consistent with what you say when you're not under hypnosis. And your whole lifestyle had better check. It's not just a question of walking in off the street and saying, hey, I was abducted and it looked like a box of cornflakes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. To say is that there is, there is a mythology, uh, there is a folklore in the popular culture 
and, and by and large, and if we look at mm -hmm. the movies and then the cultural yeah. expressions of, of uh, aliens, yeah. they do look alike. And indeed, in the, in the deep psyche of people, uh, we think that they have larger heads, um, extended brains, etc., etc. And I'm trying to, that, that's what I was trying well, to say. Uh, the, How much is it? I don't want to go into the, the descriptions of the, of the figures. Uh, many of the drawings that uh, uh, we, we used as the basis for the drawings in Close Encounters of the Third Kind because of Alan Hynix being the technical advisor. Actually, that there was an attempt to base the figures on the drawings of previous cases. You mentioned folklore and mythology, which is extremely important. We have two basic science fiction myths about contact with extraterrestrials, and, one, and they've both been described here. One is that they are enemies, they're going to come and swoop down on us, and you know, the body snatcher idea. The other is the total opposite, that they are godlike and they're going to land like Michael Rennie stepping out of that beautiful ship, you know, all glistening, and save us from cancer and pollution and everything else. Neither one of these uh, particular scenarios turn up in these abduction accounts. The abduction accounts are totally neutral, medical in nature, scientific in nature. There is often pain involved. Uh, one of the descriptions that often surfaces is of a needle with a tiny ball on the end, which is two millimeters in diameter roughly to three millimeters reported over and over again. It is put up the nostril, there's some pain, seems to break through up in here, the little projections from it as if it's held in place and other descriptions have a needle which goes in with nothing on it and when it comes out there's a ball on it that wasn't there to begin with as if they're put in and taken out. Now one of the psychologists who, and, and I work with a whole panel of psychologists and psychiatrists who have done uh, not only blind psychological testing with people uh, just to look into their mental stability and they are all the people that have been examined in this particular sample. Uh, there's no mental illness, no heavy duty you know, uh, paranoia, schizophrenia. However, they all show the signs of having suffered severe traumas, very much like rape victims. But at any rate, the psychologist who did that one set of tests said, why would anybody fantasize a thing about a needle which goes up the nostril and breaks through? In some other cases, the needle goes in the eye socket below the eyeball and sometimes in the ear. Now, we get these descriptions, because now where they're public, we're talking about it, but we get these, have gotten these descriptions over the years from many different people before any of that material was published. And that does not fit with mythology, quote unquote, that one gets from uh, science fiction. There will be at the uh, symposium Dr. Thomas Edward Bullard, who uh, got his PhD from Indiana University in uh, folklore. And uh, he has done an intensive study of abduction cases. He has analyzed 280 reports, literally from around the world, very meticulous analysis. And uh, he concludes that uh, in comparing the key factors in, in myths about little people and fairy stories, et cetera, over the years, uh, and comparing the key factors which keep cropping up in uh, abduction stories, there is a difference. In other words, you can tell an abduction story from a fairy story uh, simply by looking at how the, uh, how the story develops. The, uh, the reports that people make about abductions are not the same things that they've been, have been made over the years about fairies and little people and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm t saying this comes from a man who's got his Ph.D. in folklore, so he, he ought to know. Now, before we go on, I want to say that uh, we have run out of, uh, out of time for our camera crew. But since there's so much interest in the topic, we're going to continue, but the uh, camera crews will be taking off. And we're going to try over here, right here, then you, uh, Jeff, and yeah. then you. Chris Hansen, Reuters News Service. Mr. Chandra, you mentioned uh, an organization called Majestic 12. Uh, uh, is there any documentary evidence you've come across that it exists? Can you tell us? what department of government it belongs to, how large you think it is, uh, does it still exist? Um, any kind of detail like that would be very interesting. The, um, the document that we uh, have released now to the press includes the names of all the original 12. So Majestic 12 it had 12 individuals that were part of the, the original group. We have found evidence in the National Archives a memo from a, the then uh, National Security Assistant to uh, President Eisenhower in 1954, General Cutler, sent a memo to General Twining, and General Twining, Air Force General, was one of the original 12 of the Majestic 12 group. 
stating that the National Security Council slash MJ-12, and MJ-12 is the, the Majestic uh, breaks down into to two different uh, subheads, MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C, and this document is labeled Top Secret slash MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C. And they're also referred to as MJ-12. So that a National Security Council slash MJ-12 Special Studies Project would be held in concurrent with a meeting in the White House. So it does, in fact, tie the MJ-12 group to the President and to the White House and the National Security Council as of 54. The indications are, yes, this group still exists and still maintains this information, and they do not belong to a government agency. They are their own agency. So you can't access them through FOIA or anything else because there's no known address or anything through normal channels to get to this group. What, what are the indications that they still exist? We're studying a, a good deal of the information and the information that, that, that Bill Moore and Stan Friedman and myself have, have garnered from this is, is extensive. Um, so until we're ready to break some of that out, we've finished our investigation to where we're satisfied that there isn't you know, an overabundance of disinformation within that information. I'll just say that the indications are that, that um, well, there was a question here earlier about sightings and so forth. One of the indications through the intelligence operatives that we're talking with is that the predominance of sightings or alien visitation areas is in the southwest. It's in New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and in uh, North and South Dakota. Um, but there's a predominance of, of, of information that indicates that this group still exists and um, their role is very active. Excuse me, just pause for a second. Hold on a second. Maybe the cameras want to do uh, left to right, and then uh, we're going to take Jeff. And 